Simon Jones is one of the finest cricketing talents to have represented England this century, with only two serious injuries preventing him from fulfilling his vast potential at international level. Simon's career highlight came in 2005 when he formed part of the England attack, which proved crucial in defeating Australia to win the Ashes for the first time since 1987. In total, he played 18 test matches and eight one-day internationals for England, while at county level he represented Glamorgan, Worcestershire and Hampshire before retiring from first-class cricket in 2013. We will be joined by Simon in a moment. Steve, as someone you've played with at the very top of international cricket and you know very well, what can we expect from tonight's programme? The emotions from tonight for me would be quite a few because the relationship I've had with Simon over the years, you know, it's like a, a family thing from 2003 to about 2005, six, And to see him go through the stuff that he had gone through was heartbreaking sometimes. Bear in mind, I was, the, I was at the front of the stretcher, carried him off in Brisbane when he did his knee for the first time. You know, you've seen the video of that and it's, it's horrendous. It's and bad. to come from that to then seeing him go through his rehab and going through the highs of being the, one of the very best bowlers in the world, part of England's arguably greatest ever seam attack of all time, winning the Ashes in 2005 to be alongside Simon, to then he never played international cricket again, which was always very, very difficult. So I see him now and again through the PCM Master stuff. Um, But I'd be intrigued to to hear his story. And the one thing Simon has always been in life is honest. He will tell us the truth about what happened and the struggles he's had mentally and physically. And I'm looking forward to it because, you know, for me, it'll be uh, be quite emotional as well because it's like a family member. You know, Hoggard, Harmison, Flintoff, and then obviously Giles, part of that that great attack that that got England to a position of of, of number one, top end of the world. Um, and to see one of your mates go through what he had to go through was, was heartbreaking. So it's mixed emotions. But I'm looking forward to for Simon to tell his story. Well, that's great. Well, let's give a big welcome to tonight's guest on After the Lights Go Out. Here on TalkSport, it's a very good evening to Simon Jones. How are you doing, mate? Good evening, Simon. Evening, gents. You well? Good, my friend. Simon, you retired from cricket in September 2013. Run us through the circumstances which led to you calling time on your career. Look, I had... Injured my knee in, in 2006 on tour in, in India, my left knee. Um, we were playing in the last warm-up game, um, landing in a foothold. Uh, you know, we, we had some big lads playing in the game. So, obviously, the, the natural erosion of the of the wicket comes. And my knee was just in absolute agony. I went to see the, the doc, uh, had some scans, got sent home. And I found that I got a cartilage flap. So, the hyaline cartilage had come off the bone and there was a two-centimetre hole. So I had an operation at a microfracture. I uh, ended up having three in the end over that seven-year period. Wow. And it was horrendous. It's the worst rehab I've ever done uh, in terms of pain, in terms of frustration, because you're taking one step forward, two steps back continuously. And it got to the point where I got to 2013, and I played in that final for Glamorgan against Nottingham, uh, the CB40. And you know when you finish the game, you think, right, I'm done. Mm. I can't do this anymore. I literally cannot do this anymore. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and I just thought to myself, right, look, we've made the final, all right, we got absolutely pumped, but it's not a bad place to finish. And I just thought to myself, right, it's time to start living in a sense, stop being engrossed in rehabs and doing this, doing that, doing all the right things. Just, just start enjoying yourself. Simon, I'm. I hadn't seen the injury, but Harmy just showed me just before we've spoken yeah. to you oh my gosh in brisbane oh yeah that was the first days. one that was the first that was the first knee yeah it, it went <laughs> the complete other direction to where so you was running and you've obviously yeah. tried to slide into the to yeah. catch the ball right yeah it was you know harmy knows me i do everything as hard and as fast as i can and um it was just one of those things we'd have a warm-up game at the Alan Border Oval against Queensland and the outfield was like glass. It was beautiful. Mm. It looked like a billiard table. You'd slide in it and you'd just keep on going. So me being young, I was what, 22, 23, just thought every ground in Australia was the same thing. But unbeknown to us, we hadn't been told that they played Aussie rules there as well. So it was a totally different kind of turf and we didn't do much feeling in the preparation for the first test. So we didn't know. And I've chased it thinking, right, if I slide long, you're easy, job done. And it was job done on my knee. Um, it was a brutal pain, real brutal. That's going to beat me down. And the 
Fields quick. And he knocks it four. Wow, it's not happening for England. Oh, careful. And he's in trouble. Oh. It's Jones, dear. too. Was it that he his knee fell on the ball? But it looks worse than that. That would be a jar. And he took so much earth as he was sliding. He's taken a lot of earth, and that could easily have been when he twisted his knee, if that's what's happened. Taking a great hunk out of it. Oh, dear, I don't like the look of that. Sifi Spriggs got caught. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Immediately, as soon as it happened, I knew I'm in a lot of bother here. This is bad. And obviously, all the, you know, at, at the game, sim and football, rugby, wherever, cricket, you've got specialists there at international games. And these guys just came charging on the physio. Um, obviously, Steve came on with the, the stretcher with Jason Gillespie. Yeah. And they kept on touching my knee. And I was just like, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I, I know it's bad. There's no need to, to do it. But they had to check the cruciates and, and it would just literally, like, being obliterated. So, yeah, I was in a in a world of bother. You were in a world of bother then, but we would, we'll come on to that, the injury part, in a, in a moment. But the 2013 bit intrigues me because I finished in 2009 with England. That You yeah. mentioned that walk-off moment, the finishing moment. And I knew that during the test match in the Ashes at the Oval. Yeah. Fred was walking off. He's gone into the sunset. I thought this is a good time for me to finish. But mm. I carried on playing for Durham for four years in... I wouldn't say I didn't enjoy that fact, but I felt as though I should have retired then. Was a part of you thinking, you know what, this day should have come years ago, not in 2013? I always get asked, right, if you could change anything in your career, what would you change? And you generally like to say nothing because I think injuries are a part of sport. Mm. Um, you know, the character building, they develop you as a person. Um, if you can take the rough of the smooth, then I think you're a better person for it. But if I could turn back time, I'd have retired in 2006. If I knew yeah. what was going to come, if I knew what, what what the next seven years was going to hold for me in terms of frustration, having this injury that was kind of just taken over my life, really, mm. I'd, have, I'd have ended it then, definitely. Back in 2006? Definitely. Yeah. Wow. It would have been done. And from that, though, you went you went from your home where mm. you, know, you talked to... Talk to anybody else about, like, to myself and, you know, many others that are from, you know, the working class industrial backgrounds. Yeah. You know, home is home. And, mm. you know, I'd never leave Durham. You'd never mm. leave Cardiff. You'd never leave Glamorgan. Mm. Well, all of a no. sudden, 2007, you've had to go to Worcester. You've had to go to Hampshire. Yeah. And then you've come back to yeah. that. Yeah. That must have been difficult as well. It was, yeah. Look, um, it was one of those situations at Glamorgan. I'd been, I was on a central contract with England. Uh, and then we'd agreed terms, so if I lost my central contract, I'd be on a certain amount of money. That rug got pulled from underneath me, and I was offered terms which were basically disgraceful. Mm. So I was put into a position where, right, I've got to do what's right for me. Um, Steve Rose from Worcester came in. He said, look, I'd love to have you at the club. Um, he offered me the terms I'd been offered by Glamorgan initially, and I went, right, and come in. And for me, if, if someone's willing to do that, what else are they going to do? Yeah. Um, no, if someone loses my trust and they're gone, they're done uh, in terms of business-wise or whatever. And that had happened at Glamorgan, unfortunately. You know, they'd had my services for four or five years. Yes, not as much as they should have, but they weren't paying me because I was on a central contract. Mm. So for me then, I, I thought, right, I'm off. Went to Worcester. Loved my time there, to be fair. Great bunch always, of lads. You always battling. Yeah, I was always battling. Yeah, I had another knee up then at Worcester. I'd bowled too much. Flared the knee up again. Had another microfracture. That's when Worcester said, right, we can't see you coming back. We're going to end your contract. And then I went to Hampshire and that's where things, brilliant club, Rob Bransgrove, lovely guy, good lads in the dressing room. But I felt for me that was a turning point in my life where kind of depression and anxiety and stuff set in. You know, my, my rehab was consuming my life. I was waking up in the morning and I was checking my knee for swelling. That's all I was concentrating on. <laughs> you know, I had, I had two young lads. Um, who were young at the time. Um, it was that 2010. So, you know, Harvey's 14, Charlie's 13, nearly 13. So they were they were babies, really, f f a six and eight or something like that. It wasn't that I wasn't being a dad because I was, but I wasn't being the dad that I should have been. You know, I wasn't spending time with them freely in my mind. Mm. In my mind, all I was thinking about, right, 
I've got to go home, ice my knee, do this, do that, when I was spending time with them. And looking back, that feels wrong to me now. But at the time, it felt right. And that shows the bad place I was in, really, um, in terms of you put a mask on. I, I don't know if you guys have done it. Mm. People are asking, the question I hated the most was, are you fit? <laughs> are you fit? Are you fit? And well, you feel like saying you have to be nice because you're representing the club. You have to be professional. You have, but sometimes you just feel like I'm going to go back yeah. saying, well, mm. if I was fit, I'd be on the park. Yeah. If I was fit, I don't you think if I was fit, I wouldn't want to be playing. Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's horrible. Simon, you, you're more or less saying that in 2013, you spent seven years doing things that you didn't want to do and you put off. And was there, a, was there a fear of what can I do next? My initial feeling, lads, was, was one of relief, knowing I didn't have to wake up the next day and check your knee, check for fluid. No, you got to go and see the physio that day. No, you got to go and do a rehab. No, you got to do your, your, your pre-training stuff that the other lads don't see. But then the stark reality hits, like, what are you going to do now? You mm. are 33, 34. And, you know, you got a hell of a lot of life left to live. I had two little boys to support. And I started working for a company down in Swansea. Did not enjoy it one bit, but I had to do what I had to do. And I just went from... Over that period to where I am now, I just went from job to job. I did, I did what I could to, to get by, basically. It's not a great feeling because when you played, you knew you were good at what you did. You knew that if someone asked you to do a job, you, you were in a position to have a right good go and you knew that if you got it right, you'd do it well. Now I was in a position where I didn't have a feeling of self-worth. I didn't have a feeling of being needed, being wanted, really. And, and, and that was a tough place to be. It was hard. I did a lot of work with the PCA. Um, you know I did the Masters cricket. Yep. Um, and I found I was just travelling here and everywhere just to get some cash in. It was one of those places where I hadn't had a benefit to end my career. I didn't have a bit of money in the bank. I, oh, I had a bit, but not enough to just chill out. Mm. So it was it was a place where I was at that was, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was horrid, really hard. You mentioned that was hard. You know, Talk me through the emotions of the, the Simon Jones mentally. Because as an individual, I know you, you know, you're quite deep, a deep thinker and, mm. a, and, a, and a quiet mm. reserved person, but mm. also somebody that has got so much feeling as well. You know, you, you care about the people that are around you. Now, all of a sudden, mm. then people aren't there anymore. Simon Jones is now mm. retired. The cricketer is now retired. Talk me through that yeah. initial part after that. And how hard was it you know, for the, the immediate aftermath to get your head round that you're not going to play cricket identity, again. Isn't identity. It? Yeah, you you created this identity that we talk about over the, the the span of your career. I think mine was like 17 years. I think it was probably spent five of that injured. <laughs> but um, you have this identity, of course you do. And you know, it's, it's Simon Jones, the cricketer, or whatever it is. And you have what I now define them as as fair weather friends and mm. fair weather people that were in your life. They want to be there when things are going well because they're hanging in with you and and the people you're associated with from your team or or the environment that you're in and when you need them to to stand up and and put a hand out and to say all right come and do this come and do that i'll help you they're gone Mm -hmm. and i learned that fairly quickly i remember this one guy i didn't hear from him for three or four years and this is while i was still playing Uh, i got dropped by england and somehow i managed to get back into the 30-man provisional squad in 2008 even though my knee was pretty bad. He phoned me that day. And I thought, yeah. where have you been for the last four years? Where have you been? Alarm bells start ringing in your head when you finish because those people that you thought were your friends, those people that you thought were your support network are gone. They don't want to know. They're moving on to the next project. They're moving on to the next person they think they can hang on to and latch on to. And it, it does sting. It really stings. Mm. But it's, it's a learning process. And if you keep on making those same mistakes, then you know, it's, it's pretty silly. Uh, I learned fairly quickly that you can count the people that you can rely on on one hand. And that's, that's a genuine thing. Simon, we spoke about retirement in 2013. And yeah. a lot of large part of your, your career was down with, with, with injuries, um, which has been highlighted. The first one was Brisbane in 2002. And to put yeah. context on, I was talking to Leon just a bit before we, we came on, and it was me or you for that game in, in, in Brisbane, um, and you got selected. Um, mm. England bowled first on the flattest wicket that Brisbane's ever ever produced, 
And then five overs in, six overs in, to my horror watching from 15 rows up in the the viewing gallery to see one of my best mates chase after a ball and, and, and injure himself like that was so heartbreaking and to see you the way you were that was the start of something that you know the dark days did start in that in that period yeah it was i said to you earlier i i, I knew i'd done something serious and you know the the surgeons had, had, had suggested so so i went for a scan and they you know all the sums were all the fears were were brought to light and it was just one of those situations where i remember you lads, are, the, the boys had a tough day, didn't they? Mm. Uh, Hayden got 200, I think, or something. And they all came in to see me in um, in my room in the hotel. I was obviously um, laying down with the leg elevated and that. And do you know what? It was it was a great feeling to see the lads. But then I knew, right, I started thinking to myself, what does the future hold? I knew I'd heard about ACLs in the past and how serious they are. Well, you know, what's going to happen to my career? I'm 22 years old. You know, you, you're looking at the physio for some kind of positive comment that yeah look mate you're going to be fine you're going to do this you're going to do that and none of that was forthcoming you know all these these thoughts going through your head they sent me to Adelaide to the academy just to do some rehab with the physio before I flew home and then I went to see the surgeon as soon as I got home up in Sheffield Derek Bickerstaff what an absolute legend that guy is Um, but he did a couple of tests on my knee and they found that I had done my post lateral corner as well which is shocker so he said right we've got to do this as well Um, so it was a four hour op job done but luckily the, the Glamorgan physio um, at the time Virgin Mustafa was, was one of my best friends and we did the rehab together but we did 18 months solid six days a week six hours a day uh, I didn't drink in that period you know I, we like a beer didn't we but yeah. I thought right this is last chance saloon if you don't do this properly you're never going to play the game again and so I did it and there was some horrible days yeah you know it was it was a long old 18 months and to get through at the other end, I'm amazed, totally amazed. I didn't have a property in Cardiff, and I was living with the physio. I was sleeping on the floor on a mattress, and we would just live together and breathe rehab. That's all we did mm. for that period of time. Proud of myself for doing it, really proud of myself. And as we spoke about earlier, it's character building. But to get through at the other end and then achieve what you want to achieve is, was fantastic. Well, at 22 years old, it shows a lot about mm. your character, because you have mm. to get in that right zone now. Your mind has to become selfish in the respect of what you have yeah. to do and you say 18 months it pretty much mm. took that's mm. like some doing the interesting thing around that of what i picked up and what you said is is that yeah you got to have that character building mm. but what i noticed with me is, is that yeah i've done my nine months and my, my you mm. know my six months here and my mm. four months here but after a while my mind started getting tired of having to mm. break down and come back mm. Yeah. constantly breaking down and come back mm. so it's all credit mm. around the crack character it's yeah, great it's coming true. back after the first one but what yeah. your body does now now your biomechanics are all messed up yeah. now there's an imbalance in your body mm. now you're coming back and now you've got to strengthen other areas you've got to strengthen this yeah. you've got to strengthen that and yeah. you're going to break down with this you're going to break down with that your yeah. knee's not going to be 100% that's where we have I think the real problems mm. psychologically mm. and that's where I feel within sport we don't look after that properly yeah correct me and if i'm wrong no I, I totally agree and do you know what i never ever 100 percent ever again because there was always that fear of i didn't really know yeah do you know what i mean mm-hmm. you're always operating at about 85 90 i reckon after that <laughs> yeah. because you are thinking yeah, 100%. Yeah, I was thinking, walking uh, on the pitch thinking sometimes I don't know if I'm going to last today but <laughs> <laughs> I used to sometimes pray as much as I should have gone onto a pitch right no word of a lie homie. I should have been walking onto a pitch thinking I'm, I need to score today I'm going to score today like that's all I need mm. to think about scoring yeah. doing well yeah. for the team I used to walk mm. on the pitch thinking please don't get injured Yeah, yeah. Please, I was exactly the same please exactly don't get injured the same. that's what I was yeah. like so, yeah, yeah, I was a nervous and- wreck and you know what, though? You know the management and some of the other players are thinking exactly the same thing. I hope you don't get injured today. Do you reckon? That's, 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 what, that's I never, what I felt. I never asked the question. Yeah, yeah that's they what I felt. Are. Yeah, probably are. Yeah, I, I don't know whether it was a bit of, not paranoia, but do you know what I mean? I'm quite sensitive. Like, I worry what people think of me. I'm very yeah. sensitive, yeah. Um, but in my head, I was thinking, right, what are these guys thinking about me? I was thinking, oh, my God, is he going to break down again? Is he ever going to be fit? Is he ever going to do this? Is he ever going to be the same? And you've got all these thoughts going through your head instead of thinking about what your job is that day 
Uh, and it's, 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 it is draining. It is draining. And that tells you everything about Simon, to be fairly on, because when he come back from that, 18 months later, he come back into a squad, into a group, fast bowling group, was probably, I'd say, arguably, the one of the best fast bowling groups that England have ever had, into yeah. the Caribbean, into the West Indies. And within sort of 18 months, England were the best team in the world, won the Ashes for the first time in 20 years. Then we've had this great time, two years of of a four-man bone, a seam bone attack, five-man yeah. bone attack that's conquered the world. And not only were you one of the vital parts of it, you were fit for the for the whole lot. Yeah, the five-wicket all at Old Trafford, when you knocked Clark over, when he left it, like you'd never had the, the knee injury. But then yeah. you have you have an injury at Trent Bridge, which yeah. we probably knew at the end of the game that this might be the end of Simon Jones. You know, and yeah. that was completely different mentally from a, a, mate, a friend's point of view where you were at Brisbane for where you were at at Trent Bridge in 2005 because mm. he never played mm. again internationally after that no and at the time I was thinking again what's going to happen it wasn't as painful as the first one for me but it was still bad and I'd had three cortisone injections in my ankle that summer it was one of those situations where you think you almost ask yourself why me that was the, the tough question that I, I could not answer and that's the thing you can't get your head around. Simon, let me ask you this. You see when you're going through that injury process and you, you've had it mm. a few times now, mm. but you know, the second time round and you think, oh my gosh, not again, sort of mm. thing. You was the opposite probably to me where you would be like, well, I'm not going to touch drink now. Yeah. I'm not going to distract myself even more. I, I was a little mm. bit more destructive around my mental health wasn't great. So if I knew mm. I was going to be out for, again, a long-term mm. injury, certain other things would come into play where it'd be quite destructive. I mean, I've been divorced twice for no yeah. fault of my own. So there's certain things that affected me, not because I wanted to be that person, but because mm. I just felt that this has just taken over my life. But you didn't turn to drink or nothing, but mm. you was depressed through injuries? Or what, you know, how did you deal with the whole process I think it was just a, a build-up of the whole processes I've been through of, of the rehabs and the, the monotony of it, the day-to-day -day grind, the waking up knowing you're going to do that same thing that you did yesterday, today, just repeated. It routine. was just like, yeah, the routine was, was hard. And I think you get to a point where there's only so much you can take. That was the start of me, I think, going downhill mentally. Right? That ankle injury, but then the left knee was... That's when I went really bad, really yeah. bad. Elab and elaborate. When you say bad, explain when you say bad. I felt like a vessel. I wasn't in the room. I was there with my children, but I wasn't. I was waking up. I was almost like a zombie, I reckon. That's the only way I could describe myself. I was in a, a routine where I would just do the same thing every day. It became so normal to me, which I thought was, looking back now, was, was just unbelievable. How people didn't spot the signs of the place I was in. They just thought, oh, look, he's, he's rehabbing, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's fine. Inside, I wasn't. Mm. I was in another place. Yeah, no, pa no Pinocchio's nose, you see, for mental health yeah. conditions. Ab that, absolutely. Yeah. How, uh, mm. si, how much of it, that was the financial burden? You finish playing for England, you come out of a contract, you've already alluded to the Glamorgan situation and why you yeah. had to move on. How much yeah. of the, the, the weight on the shoulders, the kids, the wife, does the financial side of it kick in? <sighs> The financial side came in um, when things like were, were hard work. Yeah. It was when I was at Hampshire. Um, I was so desperate to play that I had signed a pay-as-you-play contract. Uh, I was on a fairly small basic, and I had an incentivized contract where I'd get paid for playing. And the knee, the way it was, it just hadn't made sense in the end. I was, I was badly advised. And that was where the stress came in. That's where I was basically living on painkillers. I was living on anti inflams just because I knew, um, you know, I had two young kids in the house. My wife at the time wasn't wasn't working. I had to bring the dough in. You just get to a position where you are just doing anything you possibly can to get on that park. And it, it's not a nice place to be, but you feel as if you're doing the right thing by your family. You're not thinking about your welfare. You're not thinking about your physical well-being. You're just thinking, I've got a job to do. I've, I've just got to go and do it. And it's, it's, it's a dangerous place.
Have a barbecue like no other this summer with Asda. Mix and match our amazing barbecue range and get two packs for just £4. Try our six-pack of extra-special Iberico cheese and red pepper pork sausages. Or our two-pack of plant-based meat-free burgers. That's Asda price. Selected Asda stores online, subject to availability. £2.35 to £2.50 each. Offer ends 1st of September. I've finally found an easy way to get a GP appointment when I need one. With the Livy app, I can see a GP by video on the same day, even at the weekend. The GPs are so friendly, and if I need a prescription, it's sent to my local pharmacy really quickly. Livy makes seeing a doctor simple, so I can spend more time with these little rascals. Download the Livy app now. That's L-I-V-I. Appointments cost £29, including prescriptions, sick notes and referrals. The service is available to anyone in the UK age 16 and above. After the lights go out, Leon McKenzie and Steve Harmison in conversation with Simon Jones on Talk Sport. Simon, we often hear about how family life changes when a professional athlete retires with added pressures placed on family life. Was this an issue for you following the end of your cricket career? Yeah, it was. I think the the time we spent at Hampshire had put a massive strain on, on the family, me especially, because as we spoke about earlier. But then as my career came to an end... I was in this kind of, you know, I'd, I'd started that role down in in a business down in Swansea. It wasn't working. I wasn't in a good place. I was missing the game. I was missing routine. I was missing a, something that I'd loved. And it, it was almost like a, a form of grief, I'd say, mm. that you, you go through. Um, some other sports people might see it differently. But the transition I had into what you would deem normal life wasn't fun. And it, it told at home. Myself and my wife at the time drifted and I felt internally there was a heck of a lot of pressure still on me to do my role as a, as a, as a father and as a parent. And I think all I wanted was a bit of help and it just wasn't happening. And it just slowly built up, built up, built up and it just came to a head and I went, to, I went away to Dubai to play in a, a T20 tournament. Uh, I was there for three weeks, came home and... They're gone. The one thing I'd been looking forward to for three weeks was, was seeing my two boys. And look, it was one of those situations where, you know, I had to respect their mum for what she did. She felt it was the right decision to do it. She took the option to do that. And it was just one of those things. I didn't know what was going on. All right, things hadn't been great, but there wasn't kind of any real massive alarm bells that this was going to happen. So then it was one of those situations where I was just, you know, I got in at midnight and woke up the next day and I had to try and sort out what was going on. And obviously that's when, you know, divorce proceedings started, etc. cetera. Um, there was no going back. But my main focus was seeing my boys. That's all I wanted to see. You know, I, re- I respect the move that she did now. At the time, I didn't. Um, I was pretty angry. Looking back, I, you know, I could have kept my cool when I was, you know, trying to speak to her, etc. But now it's, it was probably the best thing ever. Mm. Uh, I'm happy in my life now. I'm really happy. And it was just, um, yeah, it was hard because you feel guilty as a, as a parent because, mm. you know, you, you see the, the children and you see them looking at, you know, mummy and daddy aren't together. Um, you know, the initial year was, was very tough, first part of the breakup, um, because the boys were, you know, slightly upset at times and asking why you, are you going to get back together and all that kind of stuff because they were still young. But you try not to be, I think the best thing in all situations is to be honest. And be honest with them that, you know, they have to, you know, maybe try and not have to, but try and get used to it. That was a long time ago now. And as I said, it's, you know, I respect the boy's mum for what she did. Um, and it's, it's put me in a better place now than I would have been if, I, if we'd still been together. Yeah, good for you. That's commendable of you saying that, even to bring that up. Because when we're in that position as well, although it's fundamentally all about us, it's so mm. hard for our partners at the time or our wives at the time. Mm. And also... Maybe if there's a lack of understanding as well, they don't know how to communicate with us as well as we probably don't know how to communicate with them. And that's why yeah. sometimes, like you said, something that stuck out about you didn't feel like you was getting what you needed mm. from a maybe, I don't know, companionship point of view or mm. emotional point of view. Mm. But again, there's, a, there's another thing where that understanding and communication mm. comes into it. And if that person's not educated around what you are going through as a sportsman mm. 
Mm. That's where we have our problems. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I think it, there's there's also in sport. I think in maybe in other walks of life, but in sport, I was I was fortunate. I met my wife. I've been married 22 years. I met my wife before I played cricket. So we went through this whole journey together. Where some there are people that come in or get put together, and they see they just see that the, the good things because of what mm. sport can give you and what sport brings mm. with you. But also mm. there are things that when sport finishes the way the routine changes and the daily life changes and that person changes and she's seen me get injured she's seen me playing she's seen me yeah. bowl the first ball at the second slip she's seen me go through dark patches she's seen me finish my career and have really really troubled times with anxiety and everything that comes with that mm. so the whole journey went with us both I sometimes think Simon that when you see people come together and you're at a crossroads of your careers, then it sometimes doesn't have the greatest of, uh, of endings because there's not enough understanding of what actually each other are going through. Yeah, and look, and, and the way the other way you could look at it is that um, the boy's mum experienced exactly what I did. Mm. Yeah. She saw me when I was rehabbing. She saw me when I was at my lowest. And, you know, it was bound to have had taken an effect on her as well. Yeah. So maybe it just came to a point where it just couldn't work because everything that had happened would had been too much. It's hard on, on, on everyone involved. And how's the boys now? They're great, yeah. yeah. Apart from the oldest one just recovering from breaking his leg the other week. Oh, no. Um, I, I hope he doesn't follow me. <laughs> um, but um, he's coming out with his cast next Wednesday, so he's going to be a happy boy. Yeah. He's going to be a happy boy. But the youngest loves football. You love him, Mom. He's, he's a good lad. I've got a question for both of you. Do sports people attract you know, the wrong relationships, i.e. men and women and women and men? You know, do, you, do you think there are crossovers that sometimes just don't work because the sports people are, are so focused and driven in their, own, in their own careers? Yeah, sure. I think there's swings and roundabouts. So there's going to be certain individuals that are attracted to the fame, attracted to the money and whatever it is. But I fundamentally, even from my first marriage, it was the money that tra- changed everything. Not so much for me, but it changed her. So mm. now everything else around us became important. Yeah, like lifestyle. Lifestyle. Yeah. Like, well, why haven't we got that yeah. kind of thing? Mm. That was the mm. kind... And I'm thinking, hold on a minute. <laughs> mm. I was with you mm. and I had nothing. Like, yeah. relax. Yeah. But there's all different types of, of people who just I sometimes get a little bit lost in these circumstances. Yeah. And I guess being yeah. an elite athlete... You know, we have to go through, and I honestly think I only became a man in my, uh, like, literally at this age now, and I'm 42. Like, mm. I've just started becoming a man. There were certain things I could have done from a matured level of, of responsibility. Yeah. There's better things I could have done as a dad. Mm. There's better things I could have done as a husband. There's so many things I could have done, but it's all about education, isn't it? You know, I, I know my last wife. I sound like I've had loads. I have only had two, by the way. <laughs> but my last wife, right? An amazing woman. Probably mm. the biggest lesson of my life. Just in the respect of how she is as a mum today, how she treats me as a man, and what she's about today is where I look back now and think, oh my gosh, I actually put her through so much. So mm. much heartache, so much pain, so much seeing mm. me going through this injured emotions crying you know attempting my own life you know what i mean all these things that i was going through and i just didn't see her when i was going through them just do you know what i mean and that's that's what i learned from a lot of this you know sometimes our partners are so deeply affected that you know sometimes it is best that we have to go that at our separate ways that's what I, that's what i learned from it do you know when you said earlier about you feel as if you're a man now because you're 40, yeah. at the age of 42. Yeah. Do you think that's because your headspace is just better? You're not distracted by rehabs. You're not distracted by whatever else. Do, do you get what I mean? You've had a chance to focus on what you are doing in your life. Yeah. You've had a chance to focus on your children or, you know, I don't know what your circumstances are. Yeah, I've got five kids, by but, the way. A few more than yours yeah, as well. well. <laughs> 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 I'm got a TV in your house, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but do you think Jenga is because of that? Because you're just in a, a much better space. Hundred uh, percent. I think a lot of yeah. I've had to do a lot of searching alone. There's a lot mm. of time I spent alone. There's a lot of time I spent away from my children, away from mm. my you know previous careers, and obviously I'm not mm. competing anymore. So I definitely think I'm in a calmer place. There's a sense of peace that you get mm. from mm. not 
having that anxiety mm. to have to perform, to have to be fit. Mm. I've just got that peace, just knowing what I want and what I need. Mm. And mm. and I guess that just comes with, with experiences. I'm feeling in a very similar position. Simon, let's look at life today and your day job, working in insurance. How did that come about? <laughs> right, uh, I'm working for a company named Kerry London. They're just an amazing company. I, The boss that introduced me to the company was a, name, a guy named Dean Kalaz. And I met him through the PCA. We met a couple of times at some events. We got talking. And it's, it's just one of those situations. You know when you click with someone? Yeah. Uh, it's just a natural thing, isn't it? Energy. You just get along well. Yeah, yeah, and energy. Yeah, that's a good word. And we just we just kept in uh, kept the dialogue going. Uh, we arranged to meet at the uh, the Celtic Manor, and we got chatting. And I I put it to him. I said, "Well, you know, why don't I come and work for you? I can head up the some of the, the sports side because you now they do all of those kind of insurances as well as construction and manufacture, etc." And he had to go away and have a think about it. And then they they offered me a job. I went for a, um, an interview with him and his and the big boss Imogen uh, Kogan, and went well, went mm-hmm. well. And then they offered me the job. I started. Uh, I've been there a year now, just over a year. But the biggest thing for me is do a lot of work in the sporting industry mm. with the career ending. Okay. You know, you know, so that's really personal to me yeah. and really. It's one of those things I'm, I'm re- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't do what I did. <laughs> um, I'm just very passionate because we've spoken about educating people yeah, and trying to educate people that at the end of the day, your career could end tomorrow. Mm. You don't have to think like that, but you have to realize that is realistic. And you're trying to get this message across. And, and it's a great way that I can do this through work, but I'm also still in sport. You know, there's very few people are lucky enough to get um, a job with the other networks, working on TV, being a pundit, etc. So for me to still be in the sport, but I'm still I'm helping people and raising awareness that of the dangers of and the frustrations that I went through and, and, and you did, Leon, mm. and, and many other lads have been through it. Mm. It's just a, a great pairing, really, that I can assist and help people at the same time of doing my job, which I love. And it's the first time since I finished in 2013, right, mm. that I felt a sense of want, worth, and I wake up and I want to do my job. It's yeah. honestly, it's, it's brilliant. It really it's is. fantastic I love to it. hear that. You know, you've mm. got another purpose again. It's mm. nice to be able to to give back your experiences. And I think when you've achieved so much in your life, to be able to give back, I think is what, yeah. what you're saying brings you another sort of value. And it almost seems worth, like from 2013 to where I am now, it just seems like a process I had to go through. It doesn't mean I had to go through it, but it's a process I've been through to get where I want to be now. And I'm in a role where I can see me doing it for life. Yeah. And that's wow. a big thing. That's yeah. a big thing. Mm. And, you know, I'm learning all the time. All right, you know, I, I've had to send emails. I've had to learn a lot of IT skills and stuff. And it's been interesting, if I'm brutally honest. It, it's been a little bit of an eye-opener for me. How many, times the, now. How many times has the laptop gone through the window or the computer's <laughs> gone through the window? Because here is a man. I've still got Leon, the same one. Right? Here is a man, Leon. He is the most angriest man I've ever met. We'd have nets, right? So you're in a net situation. They'd have three nets in a row, and I'm in one net, size in the middle net. And you'd have these young mm. under-16 net bowlers who come up and run and bowl fast at you. And you know, because you're a quick bowler, they want to show you how to bowl quick. In every two minutes, I would hear all I would hear is this young bowler get the ball slapped back at him, and he and you could hear side chundering on. I'll get him to put his pads on in a minute. I wouldn't like he wouldn't like to bowl me. I'm, 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 and he was just he was the yeah. angriest man in the world. So to, yeah. for me now, it's the best I've seen Simon look in the last. Spoke to him twice on Zoom in the last you know, you short time. You should have jumped into the ring after. I was going to say he's, <laughs> he was a very very angry man. But we played a game in Lincoln, I think. And for the over 35s, England's PCA Masters teams, which me and Si are now like ambassadors for. I stopped playing this year, this last year. But it was a game where the very last ball, Si got a ball in the face. Just just short of the face, off the glove, into the face. And he's come out for four overs. The next, literally, next four overs, he's come out to bowl. He's bowled a speed of sound. He is bowled rapid. So they go competitive juices, because you now play, still play for the over 35s. Uh, yeah. England side. Oh, you still the, play. You still play. Simon. The juice, the juices still well, flow every every now work. and again, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, we, okay. we only play about yeah. five games a year. Just just charity yeah. matches. Yeah, but see, there's one or two one or two times that the, ch- the charity goes out the window and size you just let sigh off and away you go. You still juices still flow though. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, but I'm one of those people, Leon. Right, that as Harmy described me earlier, I'm quite chilled out and mild, and you know, I keep myself to myself. But if you push the right button, I'm I'm off. 
Same, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that button is is pretty sp- specific. So it's anything with my family or wherever. But if you if you try and be little me on a field, then I'm going to come. On. Yeah, I'm going to come on. for you. So Simon, you wrote an autobiography in 2015 yeah. called The Test. Talk to us a little bit about that. I tell you what, it was an amazing experience. Quite uh, cathartic. Therapeutic. You know I mean? Therapeutic. You, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just I was just getting through it, and I was sitting there with with John Hotton, who was the the ghostwriter. It was almost like um, therapy sessions. Yeah. You could just talk about it. And the big thing was, it was all based around, like there'd be a chapter on the first test in 2005. It was all based around 2005. Mm-hmm. And then the next chapter would be a chapter of my life. Next, second test, chapter of my life. Next test, chapter of my life. And it was just one of those experiences because 2005 defined my career. Um, if anyone says my name, if they're cricket, uh, Nuffy or whatever it is, they'll say 2005. Mm. No, the I ashes, ashes, 2005. Yeah, the ashes victory. It was a great experience. When we talk about people who played with each other and being in dressing rooms with each other and being around teams and good sides, people have described when the 2005 group, and there was only 12 people involved in the five test matches, whenever they're together, it just seems as though they're different with anybody else they played with. There was a special bond with it. And it came to the fore at, at, during that time. And you go back to that old Trafford test match. 10,000 people, Leon, got locked out on the last day of the game. Last day of the game, there was it was full, 25,000 Old Trafford before 9.30. So we got to go to try and beat Australia. Simon, you got six for, for 53. Was that yeah. probably the highlight, I would say, of, of, of your career that, that afternoon in the sunshine in Manchester when the ball started reverse swinging, Clark left it. Mm. The whole euphoria of winning 2005 was massive. Oh, yeah. It's the best summer of my life. And we talk about changing rooms you'll have been in some Leon where mm. you liked it and you didn't like some others it was a little bit different that mm. side was the first ever just dressing room I ever walked into where it was you just felt at home mm. you felt comfortable with every single person in that dressing room around you it was one of those instances where you know it does not get better than that and the, the big thing was in, in, in teams and in squads and stuff there's rivalries there wasn't any of that in that side when he got five for, I was happy for him. When I got five for, he was happy for me. And it, it just went through the whole side. And I think that's why we were so successful. But that day when I got six for 53, just seeing that the crowd that was in there at 9.30 in the morning when we're supposed to be warming up, it had just showed how that summer had just, just blown up. And we were in a position where England hadn't been for a long, long time to beat probably one of the best Australian sides that's ever been. You know, from 1 to 11, we're all legends. It's hard to believe I was involved in it sometimes. <laughs> but the weird thing is, it feels like yesterday. Yeah. It feels like yesterday. And that's the really weird thing. Everything is so clear and, and in your head. And, you know, you remember the you know the, the, the celebrations after. You remember the dressing rooms when we went to test. It was, yeah, it was just special memories. The celebration after was an open top bus around London. 250,000 people in Trafalgar Square. We is got paraded, yeah, we got paraded yeah. all around London and then we went into the Prime Minister um, where he didn't have any alcohol for us, which was probably not a bad thing because we've been drinking for the best part of 24 hours. You know, there was, a, there was an accusation that somebody urinated in the Prime Minister's garden. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, think, I think we might be looking at that character. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> somebody got caught, you... should we say somebody got caught short and needed a tinkle? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I just... Do you know what? It was one of those situations where I just forgot my surroundings. <laughs> totally forgot my surroundings. Do you think? I just, <laughs> I, I, do you know what? It was just one of those things where you think, oh, yeah, this is amazing. I'm going to feel beers with the boys. Oh, i got to go here. So I just went. Just went. <laughs> just went. Fair yeah. play. Fair play. Um, yeah, it was, it was, that was an interesting afternoon. So, Tony Blair did not know what hit him. No, he, he didn't. was. He saw it as a PR stunt and it backfired horribly. He, he oh. invited his. He had just gone into Iraq with George Bush for weapons of mass destruction, and he invited twelve <laughs> of his own weapons of mass destruction into his, <laughs> into his back garden for the afternoon, and it didn't. Uh, it, it didn't go down too well with the lads. So, Simon, what does the future hold for you? I just hope that life carries on the way it is. My lads are happy. I'm in a great, great relationship. Um, Kerry London is is fantastic. Uh, and I just want to try. Do you know what? Dean Kalaz at Kerry London put a lot of trust in me to bring me in, and I'm one of those people that will repay that trust. Uh, and I'm going to work my socks off for him, and I'm going to try and bring in as much business as I can. And and that's that's my focus from now on. 
absolutely fantastic speaking to you today. One of the things that stands out for me is you've said, I am so happy. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's the most important thing, you know? Mm. So, um, mm. I, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for sharing this today with everyone. And Harmi, I'm, I'm sure you've yeah, got Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. It's the best I've seen Simon Jones for a long, yeah. long time. And, Good. Yeah. And I'm over the moon to see that. Still, Not only everybody's going well in his life, um, but there's a big smile on that Welshman's face. Yeah, he's, every he's, time still, still, he's still it, handsome. Still he's, handsome. Still a, he's still a good-looking <laughs> lad. Yeah. That'll yeah, never fantastic. change. Fantastic. Thank you Simon, very much. I mean, really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. No worries, boys. It's brilliant to see everything's going well. Top man. Cheers, Harm. Great to meet you, Leon. Cheers, mate. Andrew, pal. <laughs>